Joining Lieutenant General House on stage is Lieutenant General Paul Funk and our moderator, author, and former Vietnam War correspondent, who's Joe Galloway. Please make welcome all who are here to discuss this important chapter in American history that is led by Joe Galloway. Welcome to the, to the stage, gentlemen. Thank you all for turning out. I, I'm still a little bit stunned by that second time I've seen that, and I saw an edited version before. Very powerful stuff. Very truthful words heard there. Very hard to take sometimes. I. Uh, I see the role as a moderator here with these two guys, old friends, good friends, both of them junior officers in Vietnam, field officers, and uh, we, it's the war of our youth. And uh, we see that title on this, about not forgetting this war. You know, when General Moore and I spent 10 years researching and doing interviews to produce the book, We Were Soldiers Once and Young, I, I thought that when we got all that done, maybe it closed the circle and maybe somehow this would ease up, but we realized that it didn't. It didn't close any circles. It didn't ease any pain. Uh, and what we really came to understand is that we're supposed to remember. As long as even one of us is alive to remember, they're not dead. And so, it's our duty to remember. Gentlemen, why don't each of you take five or 10 minutes and uh, tell your story? How about five minutes? And let me talk for the guys. <laughs> let me talk for the guys that were there that I served with. My neighbor, John Footman, was the guy I know best in this crowd, besides Joe. Randy and I worked together all through the Army at our careers. First thing, uh, I love what one of the guys said, and I hope I said it somewhere in the interview. Nobody wants any pity. It's not about pity for the service or what all of the guys have gone through since that time. What they want is dignity and respect. They want respect for what they did. They didn't go to Canada. The cowards went there. They didn't riot in the streets as what some of the guys pointed out, they did their duty. And I also want to say this, and I happen to be in an Air Cavalry troop, um, and these are the bravest guys I've ever known. And some of them were 19 years old, can you believe it? They were old guys, 19. The warrant officers, the privates, 18, 19 years old, the officers, commissioned officers, were usually 21 because they'd spent a little more time in training. And all of us went through flight school. These are the bravest people I've ever known. I'll see some more of them this summer. Every two years, A Troop, Apache Troop, 1st Squadron, 9th Cavalry gets together. And they don't talk about how brave people were or how many got shot or, well, that's not exactly right or how wonderful everything was. They talk about one another and some of the humorous things, the funny things that happened to you in combat and in a combat zone. So remember them for that, and remember them for the service that they gave. And none of them ever quit, not one guy in A Troop quit. And I know there have been a lot of stories about that sort of thing, and as near as I can tell, they're myths. And they're, they're things that should not be perpetuated. It's also true that in, that in all cases, a number of us were married. 
In all cases, the families bore the brunt. More than we did, knowing what was going on back here. I promise you that's true. My own wife and three children at the time in the Washington, D.C. area. Those families paid a price for that. Kids paid a price for their dad being a soldier. Thank heavens that's not true today. Now, some of the guys got a little bit owly when we saw the yellow ribbons after Desert Storm. What I said to them, and I say again, is, look, they're welcoming us home, too, from that war. And I really believe that's true. And there's been a big change in the American people. And it is important when people say thanks, even if they haven't served. I love what Joe said about the politicians. <laughs> we all, we all should think about that. And I'm honored to be in this place because this was my president. And I'll tell you why. 41, got shot down, very young man, in World War II. And he never forgot it. When we went to Desert Storm, and I was privileged to command 3rd Armored Division in that war, we had five objectives. This is all a result of what we all learned from Vietnam. We've forgotten it, by the way, but we learned this. We had five objectives that the President and his National Security Team set. And when we accomplished them, we came home. Our mission was to destroy the Republican Guards, the heavy forces that Saddam Hussein, who had killed a lot of their own people, by the way, and we did that. Nobody ever heard of the Tawakana Division before. That was because the President, General Powell, Mr. Cheney, Mr. Scowcroft, Mr. Baker, Notice some Texans in there. <laughs> they said, this is what the objectives are. And we accomplished and we came home. I could say a lot about what we're doing today and what we have done. That's another story. But I promise you that that's what this country should think about in all cases. For the Vietnam vets, I, I'll tell you this. We fought a really tough enemy. I'm not saying there aren't tough guys out there now, but the NVA, whom we fought, and Joe mentioned this in some of his remarks, were very, very well trained, and they never quit. And we called them a lot of names, and they called us a lot of names, but we had a lot of respect for them. And your young men were valiant and tough and never gave an inch. So everybody ought to be proud of it. Some of you got the blood running through your veins, I know. And this is a great community for that reason. No one should be ashamed of the Vietnam warriors. No one. <laughs> and finally, I'll just say, Sometime when I, when I go wherever I'm going, who knows, at this stage, my wife points to me and says, I'm her ticket to heaven, so you can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> you can imagine what it might be like on the Spearhead Ranch. But when, whenever that does happen, I'll say this. I want people to know that I marched and fought with A Troop, 1st Squadron, 9th Cavalry, and we kicked their ass in war zone C. Thanks. I think uh, I coined a phrase that scout chopper pilots like to wear on their t-shirts. I called them God's own lunatics. <laughs> you did? I did. And, and you were right, Jill. <laughs> I love them. They were my guys. I, I, in 71, when they did Operation Lamson 719. There was an Aggie there, by the way. Yeah, there's always Aggies there. <laughs> you know who they that bunked, was. You... They bunked the press with the loach pilots. That's where we slept. And we ate in their mess and drank in their clubs. And, and there were warrant officer pilots who went out 
and were shot down four times in one day. They would get shot down, rescued, draw another loach, and go out and get shot down again over and over and over. And I must say, I looked upon them as absolute lunatics. <laughs> One of my guys got shot down 13 times. His nickname was Magnet Ass. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, he's a priest today. <laughs> that's, that is true. That's a, that's that's a conversion a, yeah, on yeah, the battlefield. A, well, he, he is a great young man, and you'd never know who the bravest guy is going to be. Randy, give us uh, your wisdom. Could I say one thing? That was General Hollingsworth on Lamsung 719. Yeah. Randy knows him. I know him. A great warrior from Texas A&M. A great warrior. Well, Joe, when you talk about loach pilots, on the second row here, or third row, in this, in this auditorium is Jim Singleton classmate of mine from A&M, a year older, but he, was a, he decided to stay around five years, so he kind of graduated with me. <laughs> he, he's a loach pilot, but I, I've never thought about him in exactly the terms that you expressed, but uh, they are different. I, uh, uh, it's hard to follow a an hour-long documentary like that where such men that, that um, saw so much uh, were willing to talk about it because, as a couple of them indicated, the ones that saw a lot usually didn't talk about it too much. Um, and then to list, you know, I've known Joe for the longest time. He's been a house guest of ours. Uh, General Funk was my boss, friend, friend for a while, and then my boss, now a friend again. Um, <laughs> um, but um, I was, you know, I graduated from A&M, went into the Army, um, was, I, I always felt fortunate. I, I had, I had two tours in Vietnam. My first one, I was fortunate to fly helicopters. So I was a Huey driver. In Vietnam was a helicopter war. It was. So, that, I mean, that's how we, those of us that knew it. Then I went back for a second tour, at th that time as a light infantry airborne company commander. So I, when I saw it from both the, uh, Army aviation perspective and the infantry perspective in Northern I Corps, up Quezon, DMZ, Ashal, 5,000 foot mountains, uh, very few villages, very few friendlies. So, um, every, when you ask somebody about Vietnam, you, you, you need to ask them, when were, when were they there and where were they? Yeah, good point. Because it was a 10-year war, and depending on when you were there, my brother was there for Tet of 68, and he and I were in the exact same location, about you know, two years apart. Um, and we talk about it. We talk about the same, you know, Wei Fu Bai and the bridge and, and the Perfume River and everything, but it's... it's it was a different fight for him than it was for me. And, and, and that's everybody that uh, went over there, especially young folks. I was 25, 26 years old, I guess. Um, and um, you know, you're looking at everything through a soda straw, just what's around you. And you don't really see the big picture. Um, but I get a call the last especially 15 years since I've been retired, but probably the last 20 years. And it usually happens around Christmas time. And Jeannie will hear me all of a sudden start talking, but a phone will ring and, and, and the, the young man says, is this Captain House? Mm -hmm. 
And I say, yes. And he says, well, sir, you probably don't remember me, but I was a machine gunner in 2nd Platoon. And, um, you know, and, it's, and then we start talking. And, and so my, uh, what I've probably forced myself to do, because I've gone back and talked to my, to the um, two units that I was with, the aviation unit and, and the infantry unit, I, they have these unbelievable reunions that are big deals. And, and through the years I've gone and spoke to them and been part of them. And, um, you know, I always try to make sure that their families that come, and this last time I spoke two years ago to my aviation u unit, their, their, their wives were there, their children were there, and their grandchildren were there, because I, I asked for a guest list. I said, you know, who's going to be there? So my focus of my talk was telling these wives and telling these children and grandchildren what heroes their dads were, um, uh, especially in this aviation unit. When I go to the Vietnam Wall, I have more of my buddies from my aviation unit on the Vietnam Wall than I do from my infantry unit. Uh, it was a helicopter war, and when a helicopter went down, four of your four but four people went down. But I, this we've talked about the home front. Um, you know, Jeannie and I were married. She she lived in Houston in a little apartment for the two tours I was in Vietnam. I mean, we we the the families weren't at Fort Hood or yeah. at Fort Bragg. You, you didn't have a family support system. The, Families, the young wives just went back to civilian life, and the civilians had no clue what was going on. Matter of fact, I was I was uh, shot in the helmet in Vietnam, and uh, AK round made me a first lieutenant. It, it went through my captain bars and uh, <laughs> w hit the hit the cardboard liner, went around my head and exited the back. It looked kind of like the helmet had go, hit, bullet had gone right through my forehead. But, but um, the, um, and helmets are really good things. <laughs> um, but so Jeannie's at home in Houston, and my mother calls her and says, have you looked at the Houston Post this morning? Well, several weeks after this accident, I'm still sporting this helmet. I mean, they don't replace helmets, you know. And so some photographers came out to the Ashow Valley and we were blowing up bunkers and somebody with a telephoto lens t took my picture because I didn't talk to to the press. Mm. Uh, and uh, I'd let them talk to my soldiers, but I mean, I didn't, I didn't take the time. And this picture appeared in the, in the Houston Post and, and it says Captain Randy House, you know, um, you know, 101st Airborne or something, and it has this, just my face with my helmet with a hole in it. And, and so Jeannie, Jeannie calls, and, and the, she, the only thing she was able to figure out was I was still alive <laughs> when the picture was taken. Picture. And they were trying to figure out when the picture was taken. But then the letters, you know, today you have the digital age, you have all this instant. I mean, it was 14 days for a letter to go from Houston to the Ashow Valley, and it was 14 days for the return letter to get, so it's 28 days turnaround on letters. And so as, as hard as it was for soldiers, and, as, and, and those especially that were at the end of the bayonet, the families then, and I'll tell you, I've got a, a daughter whose husband has spent five tours in Iraq and Afghanistan, the uh, what the families do, and so I, I always try to try to talk to the families because they carry such a burden. We have our camaraderie, we have each other. We've got some bad memories that some of us can suppress, uh, fortunately. But uh, you know, uh, as General Funk said, these were great soldiers that we led. It was a drafty army. Um, I don't think I had any drugs in my company, druggies. Uh, I, I, we, there was no racial issues. Nobody ever tried to frag me. Um, you know, my, 
my memories of the guys I fought with in two different tours in two different environments is nothing but admiration and respect yep. for them, for, for what they did daily, living in unbelievable conditions. And, um, and then um, I thank their families for hanging in there and uh, being there when they came home. Thanks, sir. <clears throat> and I, I would just say ditto. Mm -hmm. Absolutely what each of these gentlemen has said is true. What they have said about the veterans. Uh, President Reagan said that Vietnam was a noble war. Uh, I don't think any war is noble, but the soldiers and the Marines, the sailors and airmen who fought Vietnam, they were noble. You bet. They were good people. They stood up and served when their country called. Uh, they didn't dodge the draft. They didn't go to Canada. They didn't turn up for their physical wearing pantyhose. <laughs> it's okay today, Joe. And they didn't catch a boat to England. That's right. Uh, I, I, I would just like to say on behalf of a nation that too easily forgets the cost of war and who pays the price to our veterans of Vietnam and all our conflicts, I would like to say thank you for your service. Some of us appreciate it. Some of us understand what you've gone through. And uh, I guess I would conclude by saying I want to thank this community. I was born in Bryan at St. Joe's Hospital mm -hmm. three weeks before Pearl Harbor. It would be the end of 1945 before I got to meet my dad. He and six of his brothers, four of my mother's brothers, were all in uniform. We were kind of seriously involved in that war. Uh, and I was accepted at A&M, and had I come here, I would have uh, graduated with the class of 1964, and I would have probably been killed in Vietnam. Uh, but I got to say that in Vietnam in 1965, a lot of Aggies were helicopter pilots. <laughs> and helicopters, that's how we got around. And I spoke Texan, and I slept in their hooches, and I played poker and was careful to lose a judicious amount. <laughs> and I would drink their Jim Beam whiskey, and uh, they would give me a Black ride to beer. a lot of places I thought I wanted to go. <laughs> and so to all of those, I thank them. I thank all of you. This is obviously a very special community, and, and I can wish now over 55 years of going back down the back trail I could wish I actually had graduated with the class of 1964. <laughs> so thank you. Joe, let me, uh, just talking about helicopters, for everybody that's here, there's Veterans Park is out on Highway 30. And it's the only Veterans Park I know of that's to all wars and to all veterans, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine. Uh, one of the sites is the Vietnam Helicopter War site, the Vietnam War. It's called Hot LZ. And if you've never seen a 3,000 pound bronze Huey <laughs> with, um, you know, full size bronze Huey with, with three dimensional soldiers jumping out, one of them, John Vesquez, who who's, lives here and was a, it's his, it's his image coming out of that helicopter and that helicopter's coming in in the trees and it's, and it's like this, and the soldiers are getting out. If you want to see something, you go out there to Veterans Park, 
and, uh, and just look at that helicopter and you'll, you'll understand a lot about this, what we've talked about tonight. Gentlemen, I can't thank you enough for being here. Sure. Thank you so very much. If you three don't mind, we're going to step next door uh, quickly to greet the group that's in there at this moment. But first, that does conclude our program. Lieutenant General Randy House, Lieutenant General Paul Funk, Joe Galloway. On behalf of the George Bush Presidential Library and Conference Center, the George Bush Foundation, and the Bush School of Government and Public Service, I'd like to say a special thanks to KVTX Station Manager Lori Bruffett for her support of the program, Operations Manager Stacy Colvin, Adam Tabaja from KWTX, Virgil Teeter, uh, John Black, Valerie Parker, Rita Hogan, for all those that helped coordinate that. Thank you very much. Would all the Vietnam veterans please stand? Would all the Vietnam veterans please stand who are in attendance tonight before we go? Wow. We're very honored to have you in our presence tonight. Be safe driving home. Thank you for being here, and good night.